Good evening, everyone, um, guests and members. I'm Paul Skinner, founder of Marketing Kind, and welcome to this Marketing Kind exchange, in which we'll be exploring how we can migrate our way to a more sustainable future. In our exchanges, we usually explore one big story driving how we live and work and how we might change that story for the better. But this evening, we'll be challenging two big stories, the story of sustainability and what that means, and the story of migration as an unexpected means of fulfilling it. Um, in doing so, we could hardly be in better company because we're joined this evening by the broadcaster, science writer and journalist, Gaia Vince. As I understand it, Gaia is the daughter and the granddaughter of refugees and migrants and has herself lived in three different continents. For her first book, she traveled across 50 countries, exploring the impact the climate emergency is already having on lost homes. And for the past decade, has researched into the science of our increasing environmental changes from rising global average temperatures to a collapse of biodiversity and the threats that these pose to both human life and wildlife. And she's been making TV shows and radio programs about how we can adapt to those threats. And in so doing, has discovered that the most important adaptation, potentially the only ultimate adapt viable ultimate adaptation for an increasing number of millions of people, is something that is seldom advocated in today's contentious political environment, which is an intentional approach to substantially increasing flows of migration. And that is at the heart of Gaia's most recent book, Nomad Century, How to Survive the Climate Upheaval. So welcome to Marketing Kind, Guy. How are you feeling this evening? Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's all, that's all true. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, these are, these are some of the most important issues of our time. So um, it's great to be discussing them. Wonderful. So I had I had read your book before we met in Oxford, uh, and thank you so much for the cherished and beautiful inscription. <laughs> um, I actually have the audio book as well, and I've read the book twice since we met, um, not just because of today's conversation, but because it potentially is one of the most important books that I've ever read, and one of the most important topics that we've ever discussed at Marketing Guide. But just for people who haven't yet read Nomad Century, maybe you could introduce the, the central premise of the book and so we can... Yeah, sure. ...before we dive into some of the details. So um, it's it's basically, it's, it's a sort of pragmatic book of solutions for what I think is the biggest crisis of our time, which is climate change. And what it does is say that we are you know, on a path at the moment to somewhere between three and four degrees above the pre-industrial average by the end of the century. And the effects of that are pretty horrific um, for people living um, particularly in the tropics. Well, what it does is it re renders parts of the world pretty much unlivable um, for large populations. Uh, so, so people are going to, you know, when you put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, as we're doing so, you increase the the energy of things like storms, of wind speeds, of uh, uh, violent um, uh, typhoons, hurricanes, everything. Really, you get um, hotter air holds more moisture, so you get these deluges. Um, the heat dries. Uh, the soils much more. So you get drought, uh, which is really affects uh, food supplies, affects agriculture, and it puts food beyond, um, uh, you know, it makes food too expensive for, for lots of people. And we're seeing all of these things played out right now um, across the world. Uh, you know, last year, global the global average global temperature was uh 1.48 degrees above the pre-industrial average so um that doesn't mean we've permanently crossed the uh 1.5 you know keep 1.5 alive um but it's uh, it's a very very worrying sign because we're unlikely to even if we dip below for a year we're we're, we're the trajectory is ever up um the average temperature for december um globally was 1.8 degrees above the pre-industrial average. So, you know, we're going to cross 1.5, you know, permanently in the next in the next few years and 
not long after that, it will be crossing two degrees. And um, with that, we get the extreme events that we've already been experiencing. Um, you know, everything from enormous amounts of flooding that dis that displace people even temporarily to um, wildfires that destroy infrastructure. Um, you know, sea level rise that erodes coasts and causes the ingression of salty waters into the water table, which makes agriculture difficult. And all of these different things basically make life increasingly unlivable. Um, so it's really the book is written out of frustration. It's a call for people to be pragmatic, to think beyond the um, very small little culture wars that our um, leaders are currently engaged in and recognize that human mobility is already increasing and will continue to increase. And, um, you know, actually, we need that to some degree for our economies. But if we plan it and manage it and talk honestly about it, we can make this work uh, for the coming century while we also, um, you know, resolve the other the other huge crises that we face in, you know, decarbonizing our economies, in um, in reducing biodiversity loss, in um, trying to bring temperatures down, in you know, ameliorating poverty, all the all the um, big crises that we face, we're going to have to deal with, and human mobility should be one of the tools that we use to our advantage, rather than um, condemning people to in these pointless exercises of um, trying to trying to stop people from moving away from danger. Yeah. And of course, um, even in the UK, we're seeing so much extreme circumstances at the moment, 167 flood alerts a couple of weeks ago, you know, the 10th named storm this winter and predictions with the particular El Nino climate pattern that we're likely to be above 1.5 for this um, calendar year. And yes, so absolutely. It, so so the... so basically climate change is no longer because of these extreme events i think they have had they have occurred much faster than scientists modeled actually which is very worrying because it looks like um our climate um and weather systems are more sensitive to the concentration of uh, greenhouse gases than we thought right because when when they model it they put a kind of a plume of uncertainty over how the weather will respond, you know, temperature will respond and all of that. And we're actually seeing um, impacts that weren't expected until the 2040s um, to do with everything from fire frequency um, to the extraordinarily rapid melting of the Greenland glacier um, and Antarctic, West Antarctic, West Antarctica glaciers as well. Um, so, you know, we can no longer I think the last few years have shown us that we can no longer think of climate change as something that will happen in the future over there. It's happening right now to all of us. Um, so, so yeah, it's a, it it is a bit of a reckoning. And so, just to to you know complete the core premise, uh, there's a a note of optimism in the book, even though you you paint the gruesome picture of some of the problems we're causing ourselves. In that, in a sense you know, a planned and deliberate approach to migration can solve, provide one elegant solution to two problems. The problem of warming essentially in the global south, even though that reaches and affects all of us, more unlivable in the global south, and the problem of a reduced working age population across much of the global north. So in a sense, migration can be one elegant solution to two problems with potentially a uh, substantial increase in the flows of migrants with, I think, you know, one of the statistics cited in the book is the estimate that there could be approximately a billion climate refugees per degree of temperature, average temperature rise. Now, if we think about this year, it's a, it's a big year for democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, about half the people in the planet have the opportunity to participate in some way in a national election this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and the story, you know, we think about narratives at, at Marketing Kind and the, mm. the narrative of migration is hardly missing from, you know, the story of democracy this year. Um, mm. In the UK, we're currently debating the safety of Rwanda bill, which was described today by the High Commissioner for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees as a fake policy and was described uh, just a few days ago by the 
relatively neutral and objective Financial Times as being a policy which is legally, practically, and morally dubious. Um, but we're not alone in the UK. Gears Wilders has just been elected in the Netherlands. Marine Le Pen is doing well in France. We've got Georgia Maloney in Italy, still got Victor Orban in Hungary. The Mexico border is a highly contentious issue in US politics. Um, so the story of migration is hardly missing, but it's mostly sort of taken over by right wing populists and not as something that's advocated for, but, but quite the reverse. Why do you think we're getting the story so badly wrong on migration? Yeah, well, the the narrative around migration has helped drive the rise of populism and it's the biggest populist tool. Right. Well, this is what populists always do. They blame policy failures, people's, you know, lack of housing or um, the economy being sluggish or uh, unemployment. All of these issues are blamed on minority groups, whether um, whether that's uh, immigrants or um, people of a different color or faith or whatever. They're very easy targets. And, and that's exactly what populists always do. That's what we expect populists to do. I think the bigger problem has been this this kind of uh, timidity by by other parties, by centrists, by left wing, um, and you know different parties to challenge what is becoming quite extreme policies. I mean, we we talk about this Rwanda thing. This is a this is actually a complete joke, ridiculous policy every way, any way that you look at it. I mean, it's vastly expensive. It would you know involve a very very small number of people. It's you know legally looks you know very either impossible or it's it's a huge problem um and it's something that would be dismissed you know in in an afternoon under normal circumstances but we have become we've come so far along the sort of extremist um path now along this narrative that that it almost seems the more bizarre and the more mad the idea the more people will go for it um we this is this is doomed to fail right human mobility is a fact of life it's part of what it means to be human it's not going to go away we're not going to be able to um you know turn back people who are moving it's it's actually not possible it's you know it is inevitable now that uh, people will migrate the numbers are increasing um and it will only go up what what we need to do is step back from this and start having a more practical and reasonable response to it. And, you know, there is a big danger when there is inequality in society, when the economy is stagnant, for, for people to look for a reason to blame others, to, to, to pinpoint. Um, and it makes parties that are populist who can who can simplify any narrative down to very very sort of essential um phrases slogans and so on it makes them seem like perhaps they're the ticket out of this rather than these kind of um you know long-winded negotiations over complex things these these other um populists are offering this very um seductive easy slogan driven narrative and that is a real issue and the way we deal with that is by being honest about migration about the benefits of course as well as the um, issues and some of the issues that migration brings is that at the moment for example especially in Britain but in many other countries as well we have a terrible um, housing policy, which means people there aren't enough houses for the existing population, let, a get, let alone for an expanded population. You know, for migration to work and to be the economic boost that actually almost all of our northern economies desperately need, we have to also step up the initial investment in things like housing, access to healthcare, access to schooling, all of those things, infrastructure, you know which many governments have let decline and our government particularly 
um, noticeably compared to the, its European neighbours, has uh, not invested in any of these things to to even the average level, um, and so it does bring it does bring an element of conflict. But having said that. Even in places like Britain, where housing, there is a huge housing shortage and there is huge poverty and inequality, the um, approach, the, the xenophobia and the approach towards um, uh, towards migrants has has massively fallen over just even the last decade. Um, people are generally positive um, about immigration. Um, you know, the, the narrative spouted by the leader of this country is not reflected in um, general polling um, and general attitudes, although we shouldn't rest on our laurels because it can easily be manipulated. My, my sense as well is that, that Rishi Sunak is looking in the rearview mirror when he thinks uh, in terms of what he thinks might be um, popular. But uh, interestingly, actually, we were talking to a senior conservative member of the House of Lords recently, and I was raising my concerns with the Rwanda policy. And his immediate response was the irony is in 10 years time, we're going to be fighting for migrants. I so know. Well, exactly. Exactly. It really we need to be honest. We need to be pragmatic. We need to actually look at our you know, we live in this post-industrial society where we haven't really invested, even in the even in the elements of our, you know, industries that we have that, that could take us out of this, um, these uh, sort of economic traps. What we need, we have shortages, labor shortages in everything, um, from you know, from care work to um, hospitality to farm labor, everything. And the only way we solve these problems is through immigration. Um, and we also, of course, have this demographic, massive demographic decline. You know, over the next few decades, we're going to lose the equivalent um, population of the Black Death in the Middle Ages. You know, this is a massive, massive problem. <laughs> um, but it doesn't need to be, right? Because there are people with skills, with enthusiasm, with um, that, that, that could help uh, drive our societies into the next century. Which actually sort of brings us to the other side of the story, because it's, it's rare to come across a, a book that has a big new idea in sustainability. And we've talked to plenty of leaders of the sustainability movement and marketing kind from the environmentalist Mike Berners-Lee to John Elkington, who developed the triple bottom mm -hmm. line concept. Now, you, you might think that sustainability professionals would be all over migration. Mm -hmm. We tend to be um, internationally minded, so we recognize the interdependencies. We tend to be business oriented, so we can see the economic benefits of, of migration and probably working on the climate emergency and social impact and so on is compatible with a socially progressive mindset. And yet, you know, for example, I, the migration just seems to be missing from the sustainability conversation. We were at Anthropy. Um, both last year when it was founded and this year, which is a, a three day conference at the Eden Project in Cornwall, looking at um, how we can create a sustainable future for national life in the UK. I don't remember migration being mentioned once in year one. And this year, knowing that our conversation was coming up, I specifically listened out for it and I didn't hear it mentioned once this year, even though I'd raised it with some of the key uh, speakers. And oh, well, thank you for doing that, because it is it's absolutely key. Right. Because the biggest source of this problem and the biggest solution to this problem is us. It's human labor and it's it's the distribution of those people around the planet that can help with this you know, enormous revolution. You know, we think the agricultural revolution was big or the industrial revolution is big. We are right now going through this huge industrial energy revolution in how we, our relationship with um, the planet and its resources and how we convert those to material goods and energy and, um, and, and, what comes from the uh, the the uh, waste products of all of that, you know, that whole conversation, it absolutely is founded 
on people, right? And where they are and where they're doing this and, you know, and where we need to do it and where we need to adapt and all of that. And, you know, it's not just in sustainability conversations that they're not having this conversation. This is why I wanted to write this book. It's also, you know, in the COP, climate migration barely features, it's barely mentioned. Um, it's a huge issue. You know, I mean, I care a lot about um, the other species that are going to be affected by climate change, but my own species is already being affected. You know, huge numbers of people are dying prematurely um, from, from various various um, extreme effects of climate change, and they're losing their homes or being forced to move or having to, can't afford food. You know, climate change is involved in, it's a threat multiplier. And, and I mean, when I say threat, I don't mean the people are the threats. I mean, I mean, climate change threatens them in various ways, uh, exacerbating convict, ex conflict, exacerbating poverty, um, all of these things. And if we don't talk about where those people could live, would live, we're missing a huge chunk of the coming decades because this is all changing. It's a blind spot. Interestingly, I, I realize you were recently introduced as the first great post climate change author <laughs> and I, I happen to have a background I've done quite a bit of work with the humanitarian sector so for me climate emergency has been real and present rather than something just in the future for some time and obviously even more the case for you with the 50 countries that you traveled through in in researching for your first book um now the race to net zero is, of course, important. Mitigation mm. is, of course, important. And the worse things get, the more important mitigation is because of the risk of all of the tipping points. So there's absolutely, and, and your book has plenty of focus on the need for mitigation. However, I, I wonder in sustainability whether the very clear goal of net zero leads to too narrow a focus and that there isn't a sort of equivalent of that when it comes to the race to resilience you know how do you measure the race to resilience and you know i wonder you know what what do you think it's going to take for us to get as serious about adaptation and coming to terms with the inevitable consequences of the climate emergency that is unfolding as we sort of are gradually getting into gear in terms of mitigation and emissions reduction yeah, this has been, you know, decades now in the making. Um, you know, when I first started working in climate change, adaptation was something of a dirty word. People wouldn't talk about it because it meant that you were giving up on mitigation, that you were admitting that you weren't going to tackle the mitigation um, and therefore you were diverting monies that could or effort or whatever that could be used for mitigation into adaptation, which to me has always been ridiculous. Um, I compare it actually to um, the arguments against um, sex education in schools or a the HPV vaccine when it came out. You know, if you if you inoculate, if you vaccinate um, children, girls against HPV, then they're going to be really kind of, um, you know, sexually promiscuous and, and get up to all sorts of things they wouldn't be scared of um, because you've kind of given them the green light. And, and that's kind of, that is kind of the argument, I think, also with this with this idea that we shouldn't talk about adaptation because, um, you know, it means you're you're giving the green light to carbon dioxide pollution. Um, I mean, you can talk about this in a philosophical way till the cows come home. The reality is we are living in a world where the temperature is going up, the carbon emissions are going up, and we are absolutely not adapted to it. You know, the reason that we have these uh, disasters where people have to be rescued um, from some I don't know, the fire in uh, fires in Greece or fire in um, Hawaii or wherever it is, Canada, or um, big floods and landslides, all of that is because we aren't adapted. And adaptation takes many forms, but we have now left the nice, comfortable Holocene where weather was not completely predictable, but it was much more reliable than it is now. We would get 
you know, terrible storms maybe once in every 200 years or um, some some events, some flooding events would happen once every millennia, millennium, you know, or, or once a century. Now, these similar sorts of events are happening every five years or every two years. Um, we've che- we're in a different world now. We're in a world of extreme events of raising temperature and we are a population of 8 billion people um, in a human constructed world where it's not easy to just, um, you know, pack up and move somewhere else because you have to put things in place to make that possible, to make those livelihoods work, you know, within our human constructed systems. Um, So I think not talking about adaptation has put us on the back foot. We are very slow now to uh, acknowledge that places need to be adapted and everywhere around the world will need to be adapted um, to climate change, whether it's uh, London or um, or New York or uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh, you know, wh- wherever you live. But um, as part of that adaptation, we have to think about which places we will have to sacrifice, where we will have to retreat from, um, and where we will need to shore up, where we will need to protect people. And it's not just people, it's um, agriculture, it's industry, it's um, investment, skills, expertise, all of these things are going to be shifting north uh, to where it's safer. And we need to we need to discuss it and we need to plan for it. And if you look at the funding that the UN has agreed, um, you know, the funding for mitigation is vastly outweighs the funding for adaptation because it means, you know, investments in new kinds of power stations and things like that. It's something much more tangible um, in terms of the return you might get than investing in um, adaptation. And because we've, we've delayed that conversation so long, well, we're also not talking about climate migration at all. And we should be having that, we should have been having that conversation some time ago. We need to, we need to also start planning for that. It's not a um, acknowledgement of failure. There isn't, you know, we need to say that we need to live in the real world and say climate change is underway. Um, Things are changing and populations are going to be affected in different ways. Among the adaptations we need to consider is enhanced assisted human mobility to different places. Um, And that needs to be really um, discussed at the international level, as well as between cities, between um, bilateral agreements regionally. Um, Because, you know, just as much as building a big seawall or... um, um, you know, reducing the problem in the first place by uh, changing a coal powered station to, um, you know, uh, a battery storage or a, or building new solar and all of that, uh, which we're now, you know, that decarbonisation is now um, the, the, the renewables infrastructure rollout has, you know, that is underway that we have passed a tipping point, a good tipping point in this case um, with that. And um, it's phenomenally fast. Um, It's really exciting. Um, It is still, you know, four or five times too slow to meet any of these uh, targets. But um, but, you know, that that is at least heading in the right direction, especially with wind and solar, with with other elements, not so much. But with wind and solar, it is. And and that's very exciting. Is there an element that um, even so (laughs) we seem to often pursue the policy of doing the right thing, but only after exhausting all the available alternatives? And, you know, I wonder if there's a sense where even where people acknowledge the problem part of your premise, they reach for alternative solutions. So, you know, on the one hand, the aging populations part of the premise, Mm -hmm. you know, there was I mean, you, you cite a marvelous statistic about Japan uh, in the book, Mm -hmm. more nappies sold for the elderly in Japan than for infants because of the aging population. There was an article in the FT this week on how Japan is tackling its aging population, however, because this year, I mean, they're hosting a World Expo in Osaka this year, but they don't have enough workers to build the building to put the expo in. Um, But the way that they're trying to get around the problem is not increasing migration, it's turning to AI, avatars and robots. And on the other hand, if we think about the climate part of the problem, 
uh, we so readily want to find a, a technological fix. I mean, in, in, in the book, you do talk about geoengineering possibilities, for example. And, you know, a concern I have there is, you know, if we geoengineer the climate, who chooses what climate we want? I mean, we had Lord Frost this week uh, reported in the press claiming that global warming was good for Britain. So, you know, who would we trust with those technological fixes? Is there a, a risk that even where people will agree with you on the problem, they're going to find ways uh, to not go with the obvious solution that you're proposing? Yeah, of course. I mean, everything, you know, there is a risk with all of these things. Um, what I would say is if we're not even talking about the problem, um, and our leaders are not being honest about actually what do we face in Britain in the next 10 years uh, under their current policies. It's pretty horrific um, and economically mad. Uh, what do we face in the next, you know, 30 years under under these policies? It, you know, uh, what does it what does the climate of, uh, say, London, what, what does it look like in 2050? Um, we're not being honest about those discussions. We're also not being honest about, um, as we said, the migration discovery discussion. We're also not being honest about what choices we have because we do have choices. Um, some of them are technological and some people will prefer the technological ones. Um, and some are social, right? Migration is a social um, solution. So the thing is, you know, we are this extraordinary species which has got to where we are right now, where we dominate the planet. We've, um, you know, we can do so much. We can go to the moon, we can cure diseases, we can manipulate all kinds of um, things, life itself, right? We can do all of those things. And we have achieved this through our two superpowers, through our incredible sociability, cooperation, that ability that has um, allowed us to to create these interconnected, incredible, inventive um, worlds, and through our technological capabilities, the fact that we can change our environment to make it more habitable for us, change um, the stuff of nature to make it better for us to eat. Um, you know, we we use technology brilliantly all the time. Um, we will need to use both of those tools, but we need to have democratic decisions, ideally, about how we use them and when we use them and in what way and what we choose not to use. And when we decide that it's not, this is not a good solution. And I don't think that should be um, something which is enacted under some sort of you know, emergency legislation by a government in a panic during a disaster. I think it's something that we should talk about before, invite expert opinions, invite a discussion about so that people can make decisions before we get to that stage and preferably so that we can so that we can manage the outcomes to our best advantage for all of these things. You know, the world that we live in now is not ideal in lots of ways. It's highly polluted. The air's highly polluted, the water's highly polluted. Um, we have, you know, we have, um, we've reversed the sustainable development goals, for example, in terms of things like hunger, where we're making huge progress that's now declined in the last few years. Um, you know, inequality, um, the number of conflicts, all of these things, we can have a better world, a cleaner, greener world where, you know, where nature is also um, respected and given a chance, where um, people have opportunities, they have, they can live in, you know, thriving, mixed, perhaps denser cities, but where they are more secure in terms of um, sudden deluges or drought or um, storms, um, and, more, and more secure in terms of how we relate to each other as different societies. Um, you know, if you just think how much uh, the fossil fuel industry um, is, uh, how many geopolitical problems that has caused over, I mean, just now uh, there's huge numbers of um, conflicts and poverty and uh, difficult decisions being made for um, to autocratic regimes, just in order that we have access to oil or gas or or whatever. I mean, you know, the, the post 
fossil fuel world, if we do it right, could avoid a lot of these a lot of these problems. I want to pick up on a, a comment you made. You described migration as a, a, a technique of human cooperation. Um, mm. and one of our premises at Marketing Kind is that we believe that you know the world's most pressing problems can best be solved through human cooperation, even more fundamentally than through technology and finance, although both of those are also important. Um, in the book, you actually do develop some, you sort of sketch out quite an exciting range of cooperation enabling ideas in terms of how we would go about an intentional approach to increasing migration with the potential need for new global institutions, maybe a new form of global citizenship. So you'd be a global citizen in parallel to being a national citizen and that global citizenship would confer certain rights and opportunities for relocation. Um, and notions such as charter cities, which maybe are not too far from, I don't know if you came across the idea from Paul Collier, the development economist um, in his book, Refuge, as, mm -hmm. as sort of turning refugee camps into sort of free enterprise zones where people could work in the camps rather than not be economic contributors, but on businesses that would export tax-free around the world rather than participate in local economies to avoid uh, potential um, frictions with local economies. Um, maybe you could sort of share with us two or three of your favourite sort of you know, I mean, I think that's that sounds like a great idea. I mean, I think we need to discuss all of these openly, you know, talk about them. I think, you know, human cooperation is the absolutely fundamental to what we are as a species. You know, we can't even give birth alone. Our, our entire species is predicated on um, the survival of the group being tied to our own survival. We we are we have gone much further along that line than any other animal. And it's, it's really, um, it's, you know, that, that is the basis of our technological brilliance, right? That's come about through sharing ideas within our groups and across groups and, um, you know, across generations as well. So, um, in terms of, in terms of how we cooperate to make this work, you know, the reason that cities are so um, productive, you know, they have much higher rates of patents, much higher rates of uh, every kind of um, innovation, any, any, any um, marker you look at for, for um, human productivity, cities always win. And that is because they are essentially dense populations of people that are cooperating with each other in various ways. Um, that's that is basically going to be the society, you know, the, the future of the human society. We've we've already got more than half the people of the planet live in cities by mid-century. It'd be at least three quarters by the end of the century. Almost everybody will live in a city. So we are talking about cities um, and cities can work differently uh, in terms of their. I think they are going to progress probably to a position where they are going to be much more independent according to governance. So we're going to see a decline. We're already in some places starting to see a decline in terms of governance of states, particularly poor states, because they are dealing with so much, you know, one cascading disaster after another, whether it's, you know, South Sudan flooding or um, uh, drought or hunger or the central government hasn't got the power to make things okay for people there so they are they're fragmenting and the power of the government really just resides in cities in uh, in some of these most unstable places but i think what we're going to see is cities having much more power over things like citizenship mm. you know who comes in because they you know migration really is Primarily, it is discussed a lot in terms of security. It's it's handled by the Home Office. It's um, that that whole line about you know stopping people coming in and this war and this invasion and all of that is is um, along a very uh, militaristic security 
um, framework, but actually the majority of people move for work. It's an economic issue. It's a labor, human labor issue. And of course, it is also a humanitarian issue, but it's primarily an economic issue. And if we can make that work, if we can make that labor flow work using um, by by planning ahead of uh, with city mayors and those jurisdictions to expand um, industry in certain places, certain safer places to um, provide bigger um, more spaces for universities. You know, the people who move um, most are in that age group where everybody moves. They are the, you know, from teens to mid thirties. That's the age group where people naturally move and naturally form those bonds, um, those new networks. And because we are so sociable, because we depend, our survival absolutely depends on our uh, wider society, these networks are essential. And that's why we have these really important diaspora networks that assist people across huge, you know, thousands of kilometer distances. Um, and that's why it's so hard for people to move from unsafe places to safe places because they are leaving the safety of their network where people speak their language, where um, they know how to get a job, where how, how the bureaucracy works, where they have, um, you know, they, they are accepted as a member of the society. If they move to another place where they're, they're not in a network where, you know, they're, they're prejudiced against because of the color of their skin or because they have an accent when they speak or, you know, where they don't have the right skills to fit into that place. It's very, very, very hard. It's a difficult thing to do. And so in order to make this work, we have to find models where people are supported, where they are able to make new networks or establish um, or, or fit into established networks um, in new places so that they can very quickly contribute to the societies um, that they're there, either economically or culturally or in, in various other ways. Um, because that's the only way that we're going to that we're going to make such huge human mobility work long term. I was um, looking into the longest ever longitudinal study in human happiness recently. And oh, yeah. The good life essentially boils down to relationships. We were talking to Solitaire Townsend, the sustainability communication oh, yeah. here um, a few days ago, and I put the put it to her that we had our conversation coming up and what were the challenges around migration and she said we have to factor in that um, particularly communities that may be affected by um, relative poverty um, are used to being able to depend on each other there's a certain solidarity even if you don't like your neighbours you might know that in a real problem you can count on them and you're in it together um, and so clearly, you know, integration is part of the cooperation. I wonder if you could maybe give an example of what, you know, how to integrate from the side of the migrants and also from the side of the host community. Maybe, you know, there are a couple of brilliant examples in the book, the potentially controversial immigration academy in Italy, which is a sort mm -hmm. of boot camp for migrants. Um, and maybe the example of Parla in Spain as an example of how a country can actually very well receive migrants. Yeah. So, so the 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 camp that you're the um, kind of academy that you're talking about, uh, what it does is it it very formally teaches people how to be, you know, how Italy works, how to be an Italian citizen, what you need to do, language skills, all of that. Um, and I do think that that these sorts of skills are really, really important, um, and they should be, you know, not perhaps delivered in quite the uh, <laughs> quite quite the sort of uh, school like method, but certainly immigrants want these skills, right? Because we all want to learn how um, how a new place works. We want to we want to learn the basics of you know, to avoid cultural faux pas, to um, to to be seen well, so that we uh, gain the benefits of that in our interactions. So, 
I mean, things like that are important. In- inclusion is really, really important more than kind of integration, because I'm not really sure what integration means, because, you know, what are you integrating to? Like society and culture is never static. It's never this one thing that everybody is. And so every newcomer has to be exactly like that. You know, it's changing all the time. The, you know, the the Britain of 1950 is very different from the Britain of 2024 um, and will be very different from the Britain of 2040 or 2060. These things change. Lots of things change in terms of the makeup of the people, in terms of, you know, what's on offer on the dinner table. Absolutely transformed. Um, what sort of music is available? All of these things change. Um but inclusion is about it's about recognizing somebody else's fellow you know common humanity and the fact that they are part of your society that your society has expanded and includes these people rather than your society having you know it, you know immigrants from here as an add-on as a as a sort of separate thing we we need to think of ourselves and we need to think of those immigrants as all part of citizens of um, new country. Um, and that is something actually that Britain has done better, I think, than um, and places like Australia or places like Canada have, have done better just because of uh, their very checkered history of it. Um, they, they, they have ended up with much more culturally diverse cities generally. Um, and so it's not, it's not, immediately obvious whether you know that there aren't the um the prejudices as much um in in uh big cities in these countries as there are in um some other countries you know where where they have much more homogenous population and they they think say that the that dutch people look and sound and wear clothes a certain way and anybody else who kind of adds to that mix is clearly not Dutch because they don't look, they're they're different. Um, But that's a hump that we need to get through and everybody has to get get over it. Um, You you talked about parlor. So this is, this is, so Spain put quite a lot of effort into, you know, like all of Northern European countries, it's got a massive demographic issue, not having enough babies to support the aging population and our labor force absolutely depends on immigration. So um, they needed to make it work and they put a lot of effort into making it work. Um, they expanded housing provision in um, in a sort of suburb of uh, Madrid and made sure that they also at the same time um, you know, built the infrastructure for um, fast, rapid transit um, connections between the main city and um, the the suburbs. So, so they didn't fall into the trap that many cities have fallen into of sort of basically putting all their immigrants in tower blocks far away where they're completely isolated and can't get any job opportunities or can't mix at all with. Um, so they didn't make that mistake. They also... Um, you know, they they helped educate people, the existing population, and the um, as well as the uh, as the immigrants in what it means to be, you know, a citizen of Spain, of Madrid, and how um, how what what people finding out what people need, what people want, and making sure connections are made, social connections and community connections, um, and it led to much, much more inclusive, um, less divisive neighborhoods uh, where people were able to withstand economic shocks and and various other problems in in different ways. So different ways from places like uh, where where there was a lot more division, like for example, that one of their neighbors, France has um, had a lot of um, immigrant riots against because they've been so obviously discriminated against in various ways. So, you know, it's it's just about it's about making policy that recognizes that this these that the citizens the citizens and the population the society of where you live 
um, in the next 10 years or 20 years or whatever is going to look different and going to include different people and recognizing that in order to make it work so that um, so that you end up with a city that is vibrant and um, and uh, confident and full of opportunities and safe and and all the things that you want you have to make sure that people do feel included and that they there isn't this divisive um, rhetoric being spouted by your leader, hopefully. So I, I have plenty more questions. For you, <laughs> but while I would love to keep you to myself, I should start filtering in some some questions from the group. So we'll go first to, to Tor uh, and then afterwards to Teresa. Hi, and um, thank you. This fascinating discussion. We've had lots of talk about collaboration and conversation as opposed to the diktat in response to a live crisis. And if you roll that forwards, engineer, systems of systems kind of background. I was thinking, what about longer term education to ensure a generational science based understanding to prevent politicization and hate mongering? Um, so some of you may remember the Red Cross advert a couple of years ago on UK TV, which showed a young girl uh, evacuating as a refugee. And over the course of that couple of minutes, it became apparent that she was coming from the UK and escaping a very dystopian view of the future UK. But is a longer term and more integrated response to the looming climate emergency not only essential to our very survival, but also it's necessary to avoid increasing local and regional conflicts due to population diversity, resource scarcity, due to changing environments? Well, yeah, so absolutely. Way, yeah, we need to think long term about all of schools. these problems. Yeah. yeah, I didn't see that Red, um, red Cross advert. It sounds, um, sounds really interesting. Um, I, haven't, I, I haven't seen it. Um, yes, we do. We need to think long term um, in terms of scientific understanding and, and so on. We, we are, um, you know, we, we have a lot of um, problems at the moment with the rise of misinformation, with um, deliberate distortion of um, science based facts because of because of the silo effect of social media and um, and completely unregulated media in places like, you know, it, you can go on Fox News and make claims about things that are completely not true. And we saw that, you know, uh, we've seen the anti-vaxxing um, rise in anti-vaxxing. We've seen um, all through COVID all sorts of problems. Um, the UK hasn't um, historically been had such a problem with this, partly due to much more open and honest discussions of a lot of um, scientific things. But it's it is vulnerable, and we did we have seen um, a rise in um, anti-science or unscientific um, things recently in the last um, few years, and it is a huge worry. Um, and I don't really know exactly how to tackle that but I do think yeah I do think um well scientific understanding I'm, I'm never going to say that's not you know coming from a science background I'm never going to um speak against that I think we need a lot more of that um in our schools but I also think we need educating in how to receive and interpret information that we're given we are living in a much more fast-paced environment where there is a lot of data and information thrown at us in a way that just didn't happen 10, 15 years ago when most of our syllabuses haven't changed in many years. I was just taking my, my son is just um, going to secondary school next year. So I did some tours of secondary schools and um, I was surprised to see that the English syllabus still has like an Inspector Calls and Macbeth and whatever. The, the, like it literally hasn't changed at all from when I was at school. And um, so I think, you know, I'd be surprised if the school syllabus has updated to reflect the kind of world that we're living in. And, and um, we need those tools, um, especially, you know, children are very, very credulous, but so are it turns out enormous numbers of people on Facebook and, you know, various other places. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's very problematic for society generally. We, um, to give a bit of a plug in advance, in July, our exchange will be on improving the truthfulness of public discourse. And mm -hmm. that will be a conversation with Mike Berners-Lee, the environmentalist who is working on that as the topic of his next book. 
and Lord Deben, who was chair of the Climate Change uh, Committee, mm -hmm. who both of whom I think lament the sort of lack of truthfulness in talking about the, the climate emergency in, in the UK. And I'd be yeah. interested in your perspective as, um, as a journalist in how we can improve the discourse in the media. But, but first I'll go, go to, to Teresa, who's been waiting patiently. I've got two points. One is just a statement. I've set up a social enterprise called Together in the UK, and we tell stories of what it's like to migrate here. And sometimes it's very simple what you do to make people feel included. You listen to them, you understand their experiences, share something of their history or learning. But the other point I wanted to make is we are wonderful, as you said, about cooperation, but behavioural science also says we're very lazy. And it seems to me that your ideas are brilliant, but they take so much effort. And the stupid policies like Rwanda, demonizing people are so easy, cheap, quick, <laughs> and get a reaction. How do we get over this fundamental laziness to do serious work? So do you have an answer to that? Yeah, I mean, I wish. Um, I, you know, it starts with voting and 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 believing that you can make a difference, believing that you can have the will to, you know, there are these awful things <laughs> that are happening and these stupid things, especially within, you know, our own government, but our own government is changing soon, like, let's hope. Um, so, so yeah, that's true. But then I would also say, you know, look how quickly we were able to respond to the Ukrainian refugee crisis, you know, very, very, very fast. Um, the European Union just said, yes, anyone from Ukraine can come. And that that was amazing and very quick. So we can do it quickly. Um, look at the huge social change that occurred to um, protect people's lives um, from COVID. That also happened very quickly. So we, you know, we do have we do have the tools and the mechanisms to act quickly. Um, however, we we don't, you know, we don't deploy them all the time in the right way. And, and, and I think that's a good thing in a way. Like if we were completely knee-jerk reacting on massive scale, that's quite undemocratic and we should have discussions about things. But, you know, polling has shown, not just Britain, but globally, People want action on climate change. They want, um, you know, they don't want to live in a world where there is um, high, there are high levels of pollution, where the environment is degraded. All of those things. They want action. Um, we need to, yeah, we need to work better as communities. Um, our, our societies have, our communities have been eroded over the last 20 years in various ways due to things like austerity um, and, uh, you know, inequality and all those sorts of things. We, we do need to really act on that because it is at the heart of, you know, how we solve these problems is, is a coming together, is having a vision of how we could achieve. I think many people just feel that it's hopeless, that there isn't another way. But of course there is, you know, we can dramatically change our world in a relatively short time, um, you know, but we, we need to we need to come together to do it. Thank you. What is, and, and by the way, there, there's a fantastic book. I should have thought to bring it so I could hold it up on screen. But um, Theresa and her, her organisation have pulled together a beautiful book with migrants telling their own individual stories um and i think they do collectively give you they do they can collectively change the sort of macro story of of migration um so that's very important work you know coming back to the the media um you obviously work in the media um what is your sense of how we can sort of elevate the, the discourse in the in the media what are your own media consumption habits and how can we have a media environment that because in a sense we have polarized politics but arguably the reason we have polarized politics given that most change is bottom up is social media algorithms mean that we have more divisive uh, stories across society and politicians see it 
to their own advantage to play into that divisiveness rather than to to restore it you know where where can we look to elevating the quality of media narratives well yeah so i mean we have these long standing problems with the media landscape in that um you know they they're controlled in this country by a relatively small number of uh you know tycoons that have their own interests um we also have our national broadcaster as being completely browbeaten and um demoralized over the last uh well several years probably decade um to the extent that it isn't the impartial strong body that we would um that we would hope for um but ac across the world you know advertising revenues are falling um journalists are not being appreciated in a way because people feel that you know anyone can be a journalist anyone can go out on tiktok and give their take um but the problem is that people are just watching the the tiktoks or subscribing to the identity that they've chosen whatever that is um and not seeing that rounded view and when, and when the the point of a national broadcaster is that it has an obligation it's regulated in order to be impartial and in order to give that breadth and it um you know it has an obligation to for example show or record produce a certain number of science programs or um programs about history or whatever um but you know once that becomes once that uh is degraded and once that um production value declines um because of underinvestment and because of huge numbers of redundancies i mean the science unit at the bbc has been absolutely hollowed out it doesn't hardly exists now um uh which is an absolute tragedy you know the reason I went in and did science and engineering and everything was because as a child, I saw or heard programs about science, um, which got me interested. Um, you know, I just went to a comprehensive and that was where I went. Um, I, I worry that that um, opportunity isn't there for, say, my children. There's no science on the television. There's no, you know, tomorrow's world or whatever, horizon or there's very little science now, I would say, on the radio. Um, most of it's produced out of house. Um, but, but you know, that's just science. Well, the, the, it all comes down, in my opinion, to narrative. We have not had a strong progressive narrative on many of these issues um, in the way that we need. We need to we need a narrative around the importance and value of the BBC and how that is something that you know, global Britain actually was best at in the world. It was um, our, you know, crowning glory, how how good the BBC and how diverse it was. Um, I'm not sure you could say that as, as much now, which is a huge tragedy. They've, you know, cut so much. Um, you know, the World Service is uh, incredible. Um, you know, and if we value it, we need to respect it and pay for it. And that goes for the BBC. It goes for the health service. It goes for nurses. It goes for care workers. You know, all the parts of that make our society work, function, um, you know, produce genuinely useful collaborative citizens. Um, they are of value, in my opinion, and we should invest in them. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, the BBC as a brand was always one of the things that that made me proud to be British. Um, but I also share a sense that it is being progressively hollowed out and is often, you know, the, even the, the news coverage on the BBC is often at the relatively trivial end of the spectrum with a high mm -hmm. focus on who said what about whom. Yeah, it's very um, short term, short term reactionary. Yeah. And, and you know, what Newsnight, was it Newsnight's just being cut massively? Um, you know, these long in-depth things, we need them because they are, you know, they're the fourth estate. They are what hold this democratic institution, our society together. Um, yeah, so it's worth investing in. Well, um, Anna has 
helpfully put in the chat the name of the um, book, if I can just scroll to the right place in the chat. Oh, no. So the book I mentioned from Teresa's organization is Hear Our Stories, an, anth an anthology of writings on migration. Now, I, I wanted to do a bit of a, a, a pre-mortem on um, on Nomad Century. You know, I don't know if you've come across, this is where you, in advance, it, you assume that something has gone wrong and you work out and you try to think through what would be the most likely thing causing it to go wrong. Um, okay. And uh, I suppose you do mention conflict in the book. You know, conflict is the most extreme opposite of cooperation. But, you know, is there an argument that, you know, we are in a, in a time when the risk of big war is rising? The risk of war with new technologies that has a bigger impact on civilian populations is rising. Um, the risk of war involving outer space is rising. Um, is there an argument that while on the one hand there's a strong case for social justice, that we should invest in um, people who are in parts of the world that are suffering from a climate emergency that we have imposed on them, um, a strong case for social justice, a strong case for long-term investment, but at the same time, um, we are likely to have to spend significantly more amounts on security and defence, and that actually quite rapidly, I mean, it was, I think, only, was it the, the last couple of days, the um, uh, senior, um, I was at the chief of defence staff in the UK saying that you know, if we had a war with Russia tomorrow, we'd need conscription because our army is so small. Is there a, a risk that actually the kind of investment that you're talking about is going to be difficult to balance also with needing to invest in the fact that just as you know, we need to adapt to the climate emergency because it's here, they're also going to, there's also likely to be a, an environment of much greater conflict in the years to come. So we also need to be much better at adapting to that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's possible that there will be a lot more conflict. It's also the reverse is possible. I mean, you know, because of our collaborations, you know, if, if a country invades one country, then they're part of a collaboration, right? Whether it's NATO or, or whatever alliance that you have. Um, you're not just invest, inv invading one. And that, that sort of thing has held a lot of um, wars um, at bay, I think. And the reason that we've had this luxury of um, peace over the, over the past sort of 60 years with, with you know, obviously some quite horrible exceptions. Um, you know, generally, our interests are aligned in not... In, in collaborating rather than um, through conflict, you know, because our economies are all interlaced. Um, you know, we saw what happened um, during COVID when a lot of those those cooperative collaborations broke down because everybody was sort of trying to cope with their own problem. And, and suddenly we couldn't get goods shipped from one place to another. There was huge waiting times, costs of all the materials went up because nothing could move. You know, we're, we're absolutely interdependent yeah. on each other for, for everything. So, yeah, I mean, there is always a risk um, of conflict. Um, but our, all of our interests are, are much more aligned with cooperation, with um you know, sharing uh, energy, sharing uh, resources uh, through trade, mainly the economic um, advantages that that brings. Um, and, and, you know, that includes human labor um, as people move for, from various places. Um, so in terms of, you know, investing, I'm, I'm not a, a military expert um, and I understand the arguments for um, building up your defense force significantly to to um put off an invasion to but you know at the same time i would say that there are countries that have got rid of their military altogether um and put instead invested in like costa rica is invested in nature um and costa rica has been a much more functioning democracy compared to all of its crazy neighbors that are constantly having one um issue after another um so it's quite a quite a nice example of that um you know but but then 
you know, in the real world, do, do we need, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, I would go, you know, I would, I would rather see investment in other things, but you know, I'm, I'm, that's not my, it's not my expertise. No, um, we have to draw to a close shortly because we're respectful of your time and it's just been such a wonderful conversation. But, you know, you have a lot of fans at, at Marketing Kind. So we're a community of, uh, ma- a lot of us are marketers. Not all of us have marketing in the job title. We're change agents. Um, we also um, work with various charities and social enterprises on their, supporting a different one with their growth strategy each month. Um, what what are the kind of things that we can do to best support this agenda, whether it's through civil society or or through business? What are the sort of bottom up things that we can do if we're fully? Um, support- well, you know, your your entire enterprise is about communication, uh, which is so key. You know, that is we need that to collaborate. That's why we're such good collaborators because we're such good communicators, and and vice versa. It's a virtuous circle, and. You know, all of these issues, it's about talking about them. It's about having a conversation, normalizing the conversation, um, which which still isn't there. We're still not there yet. We will still get reports about climate change and people know that it's an issue. But there's honesty about really what we can expect to see and how will it will affect people and um and normalizing the the idea of human mobility that people live in different places and that's fine. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know um in fact it's it's got huge economic and cultural benefits as well i think that's that's really important and you know it's to do with checking where invest where your investments are made where's your you know where's your pension um is it in the dying industries of fossil fuels making everything worse or is it in you know more socially progressive um economically better that means as well generally um uh funds you know it's it's that sort of thing and and yeah i mean (laughs) you're already you know doing the job that we all need to do which is helping um create a better society well we could definitely um be galvanized by the example that you're setting i um everybody should read actually it's not just me the observer has said that um, yeah. every politician but every person on the planet should read nomad mm-hmm. century <laughs> that's very kind the, the climate upheaval it's been endorsed you know as a story it's been endorsed by fiction writers eki tamil kuran um kim stanley robinson there are a lot of fans of him in the community um, they are all supporters of of your book. Um, it was one of the most important books I've read. This is one of the most important conversations that we've had, and I'm looking forward to watching the the, the replay myself, so I can make sure that that I don't miss anything that maybe went past too quickly for me first time round. And oh, I- Paul, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for such a really interesting conversation, and you know, great questions. Um, uh, from the audience as well and you know these these kinds of initiatives these um sharing of ideas is what creates the vision and the vision is what creates the world that we are all going to inhabit so you know it is down to us and it's down to people like you um helping to foment these ideas to solidify them in people's minds that they can then fuse with other ideas and create a better world so um thank you so much <laughs> Thank you, and what a wonderful note to to close on. (laughs) Thank you.